This is Tokens. I'm Lee C. Camp. We, in a couple of hours, carved out what we could as two white folks telling a story, but it couldn't be the whole thing. That's Lee Nash, former vocalist in the band Six Pence, None the Richer, and now an accomplished solo artist in her own right. She's describing a co-write she had with fellow singer-songwriter Matt Marr. The whole process of making this song, there were awkward moments. Because it's going to be awkward, you know, like trying to unpack such a big wound. The song Matt and Lee wrote together that day took the title Good Trouble, an allusion to a phrase coined by the late civil rights leader and U.S. Representative John Lewis. Lewis had employed the phrase in encouragement to deal with injustice by confronting it, by making some good trouble. But to Lee and Matt, writing about the issue of racism was inherently incomplete if the story was told solely from their perspective. I think it felt so tender in the moment we'd written this song that was a story from our perspective, and it's like, okay, well, we have to find a black person, and even that sentence feels uncomfortable. In spite of that awkwardness and in spite of the vulnerability required in doing so, Lee reached out to Ruby Amanfu, yet another accomplished singer-songwriter here in Nashville. Ruby took the phone call, but, she says, My first initial response to the phone call was, here we go again. But what happened when I heard those lyrics and what they were saying, I knew it was genuine. I heard that it wasn't somebody trying to stand on a platform and and say, I've got the answers. It was, I don't have the answers. In this episode, the conversation I had with Ruby, Matt, and Lee at Nashville's Sound Emporium. Their discussion of the issue of racism does not claim a definitive solution or answer to the issue. Rather, it showcases the great measure of vulnerability and humility out of which a solution might be possible. Our conversation, as well as a live performance of Good Trouble, coming right up. Delighted this afternoon to be in the studio here at Sound Emporium in Nashville, Tennessee, with four immensely talented folks, some new friends, some old friends, uh, Lee Nash, Ruby Amonfu, Matt Marr, and Brian Sutton over here on the guitar, and Matt over sitting by the piano. And Lee and Ruby there at the vocal microphones. It's an honor to have y'all here with us today. Thank you so much for having us. Thanks so much for coming to be with us. So a brand new song I just released in the last couple of days when we're recording this, Good Trouble. And I think, Lee, this song began with you. Is that right? Yes, sir. Shockingly, it did. (laughs) (laughs) Tell us a little bit about the genesis of the song. Well, as anyone listening hopefully knows, the summer was very troubling. We've had a really troubling year. The pandemic shut us all down and and we were home more than ever before. And so given that, we had a, you know, a front row view, bird's eye view of some horrific events that happened over the summer that led to rioting and people in the streets, pandemic or not. It was urgent that people talk about racism. So I was feeling, given that musicians, you know, we haven't been able to work, and that's sad enough. And I've got a 17-year-old son, so he's got, you know, a couple more years of high school, and I'm kind of grieving that and thinking, I'm just going to stay home and quit for a couple of years at least, maybe forever. But as these things were happening socially, God had in my opinion, God had a different idea. And when John Lewis passed away in July and they kept airing his speeches, um, I always loved John Lewis. Anytime he talked on the Senate floor, I was, I was like, I wanted to hear what he had to say because he was always funny also (laughs) as well as being brilliant and um, good trouble. I couldn't get it out of my head and it was persistent. You know, I thought, well, everybody's going to write a song called good trouble and they're all going to be great. They're going to be better than anything (laughs) I could come up with. But it was, like I said, it was just, just something that would not stop the thoughts about it and what it could be. So I started working on it. And then one of my favorite people to write with is Matt Marr. And we share a manager, so I have relatively easy access to him. <laughs> I can usually bribe somebody. And so I got in a room with him. And he's so smart and talented and conscientious and conscious of the moment that we are in. And so 
we in a couple of hours carved out what we could as two white folks telling a story, but it couldn't be the whole thing, just the two of us. Matt, do you want to say anything? I feel like I've been talking for an eternity. Well, you should. You're, okay. you're the artist. All um, right. Yeah, no, I mean, I think the reality with stuff like this, in some ways, I'm just sitting back, just reflecting on everything. This whole thing is sort of an illustration of vulnerability. Uh, of like insane vulnerability, which is funny because that was actually one of the words. There was like a, a series of like four words that I felt like towards the end of the year, it was sort of like I was being given marching orders. Mm. You need to focus on radical hospitality, radical honesty, radical truth telling, but radical vulnerability was one of the thing. And it's very easy when it comes to issues like this, especially artists, because we're so passionate, we end up coming across is if we somehow think we're better than everyone or that we're somehow more enlightened. And what I'm realizing more and more in life, it's just that I think it's just because of the art side of what we do, because of how we create, it enables artists to be in touch with their emotions in a way that gives voice to other people. So to me, this felt like, okay, well, if we're going to be this radically vulnerable in these verses, what would make it I think more honest and more vulnerable is not to take the voice uh, yeah. of an artist away, but just to create space, mm -hmm. you know, which, uh, and I think that's kind of what art does. It, it mm -hmm. holds space for things that we struggle with words mm -hmm. somehow, yeah. you know? And right. so then, and then you made an act of vulnerability, yeah. I think. Right. Because we, we didn't have an artist lined no, up. No, we, we didn't even... I think it felt so tender in the moment we'd written this song that was a story from our perspective. My skin is alabaster And I understand what that means There's history in my color And a burden in being this free and it's like, okay, well, we have to find a black person. And even that sentence feels uncomfortable. Feels so I thought, okay, this is going to be years or it may never happen. But as I was listening to what the demo that we created on the way home, I was like, no, no, we can do this. We can do this. And Ruby Amonfu is someone who I've been a fan of for a really long time, very intimidated by. She's a beautiful, strong black woman with this incredible voice and i just hadn't known her intimately before like we'd known each other but not really well so i didn't have her number or anything but in recent days to matt and i working on that song she had made some personal posts about feeling afraid out with her family and it blew my mind because i think one of the references was to the town that i live in and it brought tears to my eyes and so as i was driving home listening to that i thought Ruby. It makes sense. Like I have a reason to ask this person because she's there and I know her. And so I felt like I could call her and not just sound like an idiot. And so I called a friend, that, a mutual friend of ours, got her number and then turned it over to her and basically explained all I just said in a really nervous way. I sweat all the way through my clothes <laughs> just because I'm intimidated, you know, because yeah. I, I love her. And then she was so gracious and I'll let you and take so, over. And so Ruby, you get, this, Ruby. You, get the, you get this phone call. What's kind of your first initial response internally to this phone call? Well, to be real, my first initial response to the phone call was, here we go again. Mm. It was, here we go again. Somebody needs me to help them to help, <laughs> needs me to help them to say something. And so I was really honest, as I have come to in these times, I'm just so tired. I'm so exhausted that I just said, you know, I'll listen to it. I can't make any promises. If I don't like it or if I don't feel like I have anything to contribute, then I'll be real about that. And she was awesome to receive that. But what happened when I heard those lyrics and what they were saying, I knew it was genuine. I heard vulnerability in it. I heard that it wasn't somebody trying to stand on a platform and, you know, and say, I've got the answers. It was, I don't have the answers. Mm. And I immediately connected to that. And something was sent down through my psyche. And within 20 minutes, I had just 
written lyrics that just flooded out. Oh my. And so then I figured out a little way. I didn't want to go down to the studio and like, you know, record it. So I said, okay, let me get my iPhone. Let me get my laptop. Let me get the voice memo going. And I sang it in, right? Like got the microphone on the phone and the laptop and I sang it in and I, and I sent it to Lee. I've grown tired of being so careful about speaking my truth with soft words out on the streets i'm fearful even though inside i know my worth and in that moment i didn't think ah i've got it in that moment i just felt i just gave my truth and i spoke my truth and this is me being vulnerable and again, listening to those lyrics that they had shared with me, it really, truly felt like a hand reaching out to hold mine. And Lee said something earlier about making that phone call, you know, and saying how awkward it felt for her to say, we need a black person. But that is exactly the right answer. And that is true allyship. And we need to remember that we need everybody. This is inclusion. It's gonna, it has to be about inclusion if we're ever going to get through this. Would y'all sing it for us? I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My skin is alabaster. And I understand what that means There's history in my color And a burden in being this free And the burden is the wall between you and me But there's a love that's still turning over tables and a love making blinded I see there's a healing that's waiting in the water that's still making saints out of rebels my God is still making good trouble grown tired of being so careful about speaking my truth with soft words out on the streets i'm fearful even though inside i know my worth but i'll never give up even when it because love is still turning over tables And love still makes the blinded I see And there's a healing that's waiting in the water That's still making saints out of rebels My God is still making good trouble Good trouble, good trouble. My God is still making good trouble. Good trouble, good trouble. My God is still making good trouble. dream still worth holding let's walk towards the fire and push past the fear and call him a liar loud and clear there's a love that's still turning over tables and a love making blinded I see there's a healing that's 
still making saints out of rebels My God is still making good trouble Good trouble Good trouble My God is still making good trouble Good trouble Good trouble Still making good trouble Beautiful anthem. Thank you. Good, good words. You're listening to Tokens, Public Theology, Human Flourishing, and the Good Life. We're most grateful to have you joining us. If you've not yet done so, please subscribe today to the Tokens Podcast on Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. We do love hearing from you and are always pleased to hear some of the things you'd like to hear more about. You can email us at podcast at tokenshow.com. Also remember you can sign up for our email list or find out how to join us for a live event all at tokenshow.com. This is our interview with Ruby Amonfu, Lee Nash, and Matt Marr recorded at Nashville's famous Sound Emporium. Coming up, we'll hear more from each of them about the notion of what it might mean to make some good trouble as well as the ways in which such a notion may be equally a necessary challenge and a cause for hope. Part two, in just a moment. Welcome back to Tokens and our interview with Ruby Amonfu, Lee Nash, and Matt Marr. So the John Lewis quote, he, he may have used that line a lot, but the one I've got here, Lewis said, Do not get lost in a sea of despair. Be hopeful. Be optimistic. Our struggle is not the struggle of a day, a week, a month, or a year. It is the struggle of a lifetime. Never, ever be afraid to make some noise and get in good trouble, necessary trouble. So I'm wondering, as artists and as artists in Nashville, in the Bible Belt, and for at least two of you, artists in the contemporary Christian music world, In what ways does artistry, Nashville artistry, and contemporary Christian music artistry inhibit good, necessary trouble, and in what ways might it facilitate it? I have an opinion, a recent opinion, because of a really cool conversation I got to have. I got to be on a panel, and Pastor Shirley Caesar was on it, and there was some talk about, and this, it sounds a little... Uh, brash to say this, but how white people like to try to fix things. And I found some truth in that. And I think maybe especially in a super kind of attempting to control an environment like in the contemporary Christian scene or evangelical church, you know, it's controlled. Everything's okay. We don't have any issues here. And if we do, we're going to fix them. We're going to fix it. And it's not there. And that can be a lie. And so I think there, like Matt was speaking, there can never be too much vulnerability, in my opinion. And yeah, I think being vulnerable, I think not just passively sitting and listening and going, okay, teach me, because it's really not the black person or the person of color. It's not their job to teach me how to act right or how to think right. Like we need to be reading books and actively listening and not actively running our mouths about how to fix this. Yeah. I mean, I think we're dealing with issues where it's the collision of a lot of well-intentioned people trying to mitigate safety. Hmm. And that's hard. I mean, it's just sort of like, that's the business of church, right? Where it's like, in some ways we provide answers for people on Sunday morning. And the idea that the proposition of the whole notion of a gospel that is primarily saying, yeah, yeah, there is good news, but it doesn't mean that suffering automatically goes away. There's no magic pill for it. In fact, the word compassion means to suffer with. And I think that that's probably, in some ways, it's hard because there's sort of this thing where we live in a day and age where we're more disconnected from each other. We're more disconnected from suffering than ever before. And that's the thing that actually people need help having and finding meaning from. So I I mean, I guess what I would say is that first of all, I lament it with you 
I think the second thing is we've kind of mitigated and built strategies around dealing with a lot of major, you know, quote unquote sins, social infractions, you know, what, whatever you want to call it, depending who's listening. Yeah. Racism's not one that we've actually built stuff for. So for example, if I want to say that I have a problem with lust, there's 450 books, there's men's accountability groups, there's like a million and one strategies for dealing with it. And racism's a sin. So like the fact that there's no strategies, I've been in ministry for 25 years, I've never heard someone give a call, like an altar call where they talked about, if you want to confess the sin of racism, come down here and now and mm. Jesus will forgive you, mm. says to me that, well, we need to ask the question, why? And then second of all, we have to start calling people accountable to it, you know? And that's always the danger in which we live because we perceive pressure as persecution when in fact it could just be accountability. Mm. Yeah. And so I don't want to blink at that moment as a white person, but it's like, I want to have compassion. I want to walk with people and suffer with them. And I want to say, man, there's been plenty of moments in my life where God's made me extremely uncomfortable, but it was actually because he was trying to grow my character. Mm. And I just think that that's this moment that we're in with racism, I firmly believe that that's what it is, is I think I think we've hit a point of critical mass and there's the good news. It's like I said, is that we shouldn't lose hope because I, I think that the love of God is big enough to reconcile this, but we have to be, it's work. There's work yeah. involved. Yeah. You know, and, and to add to that, just the conversation about, we have to talk about and own how this country was created mm and who it was created to protect and who it was created to lift up. And so I think right now what is happening as opposed to fixing, because you can't fix something that was created to be, this is what it was created to be. But what is happening with allyship is breaking it. We're breaking it. We're breaking it down and we are going to rebuild it. And it's happening. It's happening in small ways, you know, I was talking to a friend the other day who said, I'm not ready for unity, you know, mm -hmm. I'm not ready. And I said, I'm not ready either, neither is the country, but I'm ready for unity one person at a time. I'm ready for unity with Lee because I feel that she's honest and, and truthful and vulnerable. I'm ready for unity with Matt. I'm ready for unity with people who are admitting what's really going on. Yeah. And I like the idea that maybe the good trouble of this song is breaking yes. some things. Yes, mm -hmm. turning those tables, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Let's mention that phrase just a moment, turning over tables. So it has struck me as fascinating. You know, I've taught higher education in the Bible Belt now for 20 plus years. And you have in the gospel accounts this Messiah, this Jesus who does turning over the tables, which is clearly a sort of, as I understand that in its original context, was one of the most dramatic, pointed, offensive sorts of causing of trouble that could have happened in that precise moment. And yet, the practice of, we'll call it Southern religion maybe, mm. has become instead so often a force of social conservatism not well construed. There's a sort of conservatism that can be helpful if we talk about what we're trying to conserve, mm. right? But the sort of social conservatism that won't ask these questions, that won't like the line in the third line in your song, there's history in my color. And there's a sort of social conservatism that doesn't want to ask those sorts of questions, right? There's a sort of social conservatism that leads to the sort of dynamic that Ruby would sing there, that I'm tired of being so careful about speaking my truth with soft words mm. that inhibits the capacity of people to speak their truth, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is a speculation perhaps for you to speak out of your experience, but in what ways do you see, and again, I'll put that in, quote, in scare quotes, Southern religion undercutting or subverting this story of making good trouble, of turning over tables? Hmm. Yeah, it's righteous anger. You know, that's what was going on with the turning over of the tables, in my opinion. And what did you say a while ago about... um? trying to keep it safe and talking about righteous anger and yeah. letting that out within the context of church is 
I mean, I grew up Baptist and that was kind of unheard of unless it was the pastor, you know, by, you know, beating us over the head with the Bible. <laughs> but um, yeah, I don't know if I've really answered any sort of question just now, but yeah, there's something to the I mean, righteous anger. You know, there's a lot. Yeah. And I think Southern religion is a great way to put it because it's interesting to me that Southern religion in some ways is a monolith, which is ironic because it's the same thing that they did to slaves. So they made black people into a monolithic culture and then they made religion into a monolithic culture where there's no distinction. And what ends up happening with that, at least I think on the side of, I think slave owners and, and a culture that was sort of created to benefit them is it creates all sorts of loopholes. And I think that's fundamentally one of the big struggles of this day and age. But once again, the fact is, is that if the church can't create space to actually say that this stuff is bad, but we're going to create space to help you root it out and deal with it, what ends up happening is we get caught in a conundrum, and I think this is where Southern religion is now, right? If you can't call a thing a thing, then basically we're left to apply a secular notion of justice to a matter that we said was a matter of the heart and it was a sin, but we have no way of actually effectively naming it or calling it out mm. or dealing with it. And so then I think that becomes the rub, right? Where people don't want to confront it, so they keep pushing it down. I drove to Pulaski on uh, Dr. King's birthday. I'd never been there before. And I'd learned that the KKK was formed there on Christmas Eve. So it blew my mind that, you know, eight or six, I can't remember how many it was, Southern Confederate, I'm assuming Christians, would choose to celebrate the birth of Jesus by forming a men's fraternal organization called the Klan on Christmas Eve. And I posted a video talking about it. And overwhelmingly, the conversation with people was, I didn't know about this. I didn't know about this. I didn't know about this. And so then it's like, okay, well, can we ask the question, why? Which I think goes to Ruby's point, which is it didn't benefit a certain group of people for everyone to know. I knew. So there's something to be said about that. I've known since I was a child where they are, how they are, what to avoid. These are things I've had to learn. You've had to learn, yeah. yeah. And the fact that I haven't had to know that for you, that's the part that I think right now people are like, well, why, why, like, why should I? Well, if you're going to use this descripting term called Christian, one of the chief characteristics of him is compassion. And compassion means to suffer with. So Ruby, how do you see this sort of construct of, you know, Southern religion, or whatever that might mean to you, and a sort of deadly social conservatism fostered by that? Yeah, I mean, that's that's a tough one. You know, I grew up in a non-denominational slash interdenominational faith-based church. And I also happened to be raised by parents who allowed me to, to think through the things I, I was told. So I can't really speak to the kind of the Southern religion side of it in that way. But in one way that I think, I mean, I think I can speak to it at least in in the way that not even just Southern religion, you know, but a lot of religion, you know, their kind of moment of super pride, you know, once a year is giving money to, you know, missions and saying, oh, we're, we're doing such great things when, you know, we give money to Africa and we help these children. And it's extremely wonderful. Don't get me wrong. But there is a missing of nurturing people here. And, you know, but there's so many layers of that, right? There's like, well, you know, you're not supposed to help people here. People are supposed to help themselves. We're all on equal footing here. Everybody has to pull themselves up from their own bootstraps. And, you know, and that's, that's not just religion. That's society. That's the culture in which our country is really created. 
So yeah, I don't know if I can really speak to the kind of the religion side of things, but I can speak to the cultural side of things is, you know, people feel like good Christians if they give over there, but giving here and in those ways, we really haven't defined it. Yeah. Let me, in the just brief moment left, but in reflecting upon your experience of writing and producing, singing this song together, give us a sentence or two on just something you've been reminded of, something you're grateful for, or something you've been challenged by in the process of writing, producing, and singing this song. My quick thing is just, I love the trouble that God gets into. I think this is cool. And I swear, I know this is going to make me sound crazy, but I see John Lewis in the clouds still. I look up and I look for him. I see that (laughs) sweet face smiling, and I I hope we're making some good trouble. And I love that I was going to quit, and God was like, well, why don't you do this first? (laughs) Yeah, and I make up given that John Lewis got into his own trouble here in Nashville in the sit-ins. He sure did. That he would be pleased with hearing such a song. Matt, how about you? I think... Five years ago, I made an album called Saints and Sinners. And one of the songs on there was inspired by the speech from Dr. King, the We Shall Overcome speech. And I think God kind of rung a bell during that process. And my dad died in 2017 and kind of went through a lot of life changes and kids growing up fast. And so just this whole, I think, wound at the heart of humanity, particularly here in the American story, kind of lay dormant for a while. I think making this song and releasing it has kind of been in some ways a good troubling of my heart that has said, you know, you got to you gotta keep pressing into this, you know? And I think I'm particularly am trying to press in it as a Christian, like as somebody who I write songs that people sing at church. And I think in some ways what's happened is that we've removed it from the discourse and we've sort of sterilized it in a way. And that's part of the problem. Yeah. So the thing that inspires me so much about seeing footage from the civil rights movement was that it was a lot of people who were ministers who were compelled by their faith to make, you know, those kinds of statements. And it's like, I want to walk in that same tradition. Ruby. Yeah. You know, as an African American in this country and in in this day and age, I've I've learned to plant my feet, to stand and to stand strong, so I am not overcome. And it's interesting, you know, when I wrote this, I wasn't moved emotionally at that time. I was just speaking, and then, as Lee said, when she heard it, she cried. And it wasn't until I I would sometimes sneak into the studio. My husband, Sam Ashworth, produced this song. And sometimes I would sneak into the studio and and towards the end, especially. And when he had a a version of that, he wanted me to hear. And I sat there and gosh, it might have even been the, the final kind of form of it that Lee was presented with as well. And in that moment, I just wept. I was overcome with it. And I think it's because until that moment, it wasn't real to me. Until that moment, you know, I don't rest my laurels on, oh yeah, this is gonna this is gonna happen. A song like this is gonna actually exist. A moment in time like this of growth and and self-correction and all of this is gonna happen. I just think it's probably not gonna happen. I'm hard pressed to think if what I hope for in my heart will ever happen in terms of reconciliation. In that moment, I was able to release and say, okay, we did this and this is a step. It's one step, but it's a step. And in that moment, I was able to release and shed those tears. So, you know, it really is a lifetime. It's not just one generation or, you know, or another. It's a lifetime's work, as Representative Lewis said. It's a lifetime's work. And our kids and their kids, we're still going to be working on it. So I'm just really grateful for this one step taken in this lifetime's work. We're grateful for the uh, call to one step forward in this lifetime's work and the call to imagine stepping into making good trouble. Thank you. Been talking with Matt Marr, 
Lee Nash and Ruby Amanfu about their new song, Good Trouble. Thanks for having me. Thank us. you. My skin is alabaster And I understand what that means this You've been listening to Tokens, Public Theology, Human Flourishing, The Good Life, and our interview with Ruby Amonfu, Lee Nash, and Matt Marr around their song, Good Trouble, which is available wherever you listen to good music. And the burden is the wall between you Please remember to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and refer us to a fellow podcast listener. Please also go over to Apple Podcasts and give us one of those nice five-star reviews and write a review about some of the stuff you've enjoyed hearing on Tokens. If you've got feedback you'd directly like to send to us, we'd love to hear from you. Email us a text or attach a voice memo and send to the address podcast at tokensshow.com. Our thanks to all the stellar team that makes this podcast possible. Executive producer and manager Christy Bragg of Bragg Management. Co-producer Jacob Lewis of Great Feeling Studios. Associate producers Ashley Bain, Leslie Thompson, Brad Perry, and Tom Anderson. Engineer Carrie Harmon with additional engineering by Joe Tritacosti at Nashville Sound Emporium. Music beds by Zach and Maggie White. And our live event production team at Stonebrook Media led by Phil Barnett. God is still making good trouble. Thanks for listening, and peace be unto thee. The Tokens Podcast is a production of Tokens Media, LLC, and Great Feeling Studios. Oh. <laughs>